Welcome to Women's Sweet on Women Black Lesbian Film Festival, sponsored by Zami Nobla, National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging, Out on Film, and Sisters in Cinema, in partnership with Third World Newsreel, AARP Georgia, Beyond Bold and Brave, and Black Lesbians United. I want to give a special shout out to Third World Newsreel for making it possible for us to screen a litany for survival, the life and work of Audre Lorde at no cost, reaching so many more people, introducing them to the work and life of Audre Lorde. So we really thank them for that. My name is Mary Ann Adams, founder and executive director of Zami Nobla. We are a membership-based organization deeply rooted in Atlanta, Georgia, with a national reach committed to building a base of power for Black lesbians 40 and older living anywhere in the country. We, service, we center service advocacy and community-engaged research. Please check us out at www.zaminobla.org. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce the filmmakers and their conversation partner who are taking part in this talk back today, Ada Gay Griffin and Michelle Parkinson and Katina Parker. We're looking at a genera an intergenerational panel of filmmakers, uh, and it is a distinct pleasure. So let me introduce them right now, and then we will get to the conversation. Ada Gay Griffin is an Appalachian writer, cultural worker, and development specialist with more than 25 years of experience in fundraising and nonprofit management. And as a consultant for the arts community groups, community responsive grassroots organizations, individual artists, and higher education. She is a Columbia University Charles H. Reeson Fellow on the Future of New York and a graduate of Hampshire College, where she studied Black feminist history and creative expression in literature and the arts. Her professional experience includes a decade at the helm of the radical film organization, Third World Newsreel. As its executive director, Ada was instrumental in guiding the long-term survival of this historic organization created as a filmmaking organization by, for, and about people from societies committed to reversing the legacy of colonial oppression from the 1960s era of social upheaval to today's digital age. In addition to co-directing and producing the film, A Litany for Survival, the life and work of Audrey Lord with Michelle Parkinson, who's here with us today. Ada has created programs on political prisoners in the US, environmental racism, food insecurities, and activism to end apartheid in South Africa, led by Black women. She currently works as a community organizer in Western Pennsylvania, a fossil fuel energy hub where coal, oil, and gas extraction literally fuel the economy despite the availability of alternative energy sources such as wind, water, and the sun. Ada Gay Griffin. Writer, filmmaker, and educator Michelle Parkinson is from Washington, D.C. Her creative ex career gained impetus in the late 1970s and early 80s when she became a major contributor to a new Black, gay, and lesbian renaissance of artists, musicians, activists, writers, and dramatists in the city, among them her close friend, poet Essex Hemphill. And we all remember Essex and his great work. Michelle's award-winning films include Gotta Make This Journey, Sweet Honey in the Rock, A Litany for Survival, The Life and Work of Audrey Lord, co-directed with Ada Gay Griffin, and Stormy, The Lady of the Jewel Box. Her documentaries have screened at several prestigious international festivals, including the Sundance Film Festival, the Berlin Film Festival, and the American Film Institute. She has received numerous grants and awards, including a National Endowment for the Arts grant, a Rockefeller Commission on the Arts, and a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, a DC Mayor's Art Award, 
consecutive grants from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and a Community Pioneer Award from the Rainbow History Project. In 2010, she completed her first feature screenplay, Loving Eunice, a coming of age story sparked by lesbian love during the Harlem Renaissance. And we don't have enough of those. She is currently developing Lifted, a 1920s action adventure feature film about the first African-American woman pilot, Bessie Coleman. Mm. Her new documentary in progress is Fierceness Served, the N.K. Allen Coffee House, reviving the storied history of a D.C. Black LGBTQ renaissance in the 1980s. Michelle has served on the faculties of the University of Delaware, Northwestern University, Howard, and Temple's Department of Film and Media Arts. And I want to add, because this is near and dear to me, she's currently a board member of Mary's House for Older Adults, serving as chair of the Film and Media Committee, Michelle Parkinson. And I'm thrilled to introduce their conversation partner, who is an amazing dues-paying member of Zami Nobla. Uh, Katina Parker is a filmmaker, photographer, and writer living in North Carolina. She creates films for Samsung, NBC Digital, and Al Jarrara. She's also a Rockwood Just Films Fellow, nominated by the Ford Foundation, and a former Black Public Media 360, in 360 Incubator Fellow. Parker is a 2016 2017 recipient of North Carolina Arts Council Artist Fellowship and a former instructor at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Mm. In 1920, at the beginning of the pandemic, and this is really 20, important. 2020. Uh, I'm sorry, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> In 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, Parker founded Fee Durham, North Carolina, a scrappy mutual aid collective that came together in answer to mounting hunger in the Durham area. To date, Fee Durham has provided tasty nutrient dense meals for 10,000 people, 10,000 y'all, and has donated more than 25,000 pounds of farm fresh chicken and produce to neighbors in need. Katina Parker serves as co-producer, impact producer, and co-director of A Love Supreme, Black, Queer, and Kristen in the South, and director producer for Abolish Ice, documenting Southern-based Asian-American pushback against the targeted the deportation of Black and Brown immigrants. Truth Be Told, a dark series about queer Black visionaries and the Baba Chuck tribute. She's currently curating We Have a Duty to Fight for Our Freedom, a traveling exhibition about the Black Lives Matter movement. So you all see why we brought all of these fierce, fierce filmmakers together. Katina Parker, I turn it over to you. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Marianne, for the beautiful introduction. Welcome, Ada and Michelle. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. Um, as learned as I am, I did not know about this film until Marianne introduced it to me. It came out in 1992, which, I'm sorry, it came out in 1995, um, which is the year before I graduated college. And Miss Lord passed in 1992, the year that I graduated from high school. So it came out during a time of analog, 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter film. Um, watching it was uh, life-changing. And I have many, many, many questions um, about the two of you and how you came together. And, and in particular, how you pulled this off at a time when black female bodied filmmakers were all but shut out of shut out of the industry and at a time when funders really didn't give money to black folks to make projects at least that was the well-rehearsed rumor that was the thing that we were consistently told um, so the questions will lead us down that um, path but 
um, first, uh, I'd ask for you to set the scene. What was life like in the 80s, in the 90s? Um, for me, I'm, I turned 10 in 1984. So hip hop, uh, I lived in Wilmington, Delaware, 20 minutes from Philly. So hip hop, Lady B on the Wheels of Steel, um, Adunde, uh, mm -hmm. African street festivals. Those are the types of things that are defining and shaping um, my life. And um, apartheid, the end of apartheid, the freeing of Nelson Mandela. Um, I didn't know much about gay or straight. I just knew that, you know, per my people, I wasn't supposed to be gay. Uh, so I was working really hard at that part. Um, what was life like for you all? Ada Gay? Um, when in the 80s and 90s, is that, is that what we're talking about? Yes, talk I about what, to... what shaped you and what also would have been shaping uh, Audre Lorde at that time. Well, I'm a reader. I read a lot and, and I am, um, but I'm a nonfiction type writer. Okay, I love fiction to read, but I, I don't know, for some reason I prefer, um, you know, sort of a linear, very clear way of storytelling. I mean, it can be multi-layered, but, um, Anyway, I, I, that's, that's my thing. I love movies. I loved um, reading. And when I got into college at Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass, I looked up a course called The Insurgent Sister. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that sounds really good. Um, I took the class and that changed my life. We're talking about the early... Um, no, we're talking about the late 70s. And at that point, there was a flowering, it, an emerging movement of strong Black women, not just Essence Magazine, mm -hmm. you know, not just you, you know, not just the uh, corn, Kellogg's Cornflake, Miss America, Black Miss America um, cereal box not or the layout in penthouse i mean sorry vanessa but you know it, we're talking about real work of liberating and changing lives um some of that was done in the er and the era movement the uh, movement to pass an amendment ensuring um uh fairness and civil rights for women um, that did not pass, but there was a, a large movement and a large coming together around that. But it wasn't the only thing. There were many, many different um, movements in the 70s. Um, I, I, I'm not sure why there was that convergence, but it, it, the, from the peaceniks and the people coming out of the uh, peace movement uh, people coming out of the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party, or uh, women coming out of just uh, creative uh, energy and seeing more of each other and themselves in the popular culture. Mm -hmm. And I think for me in, early, in the early 80s, I was lucky enough to be in Brooklyn, New York which where there was a hub of black feminists or black women, I don't know how many women called themselves feminists actually, mm -hmm. but there was cre a lot of creative expression coming out of the black lesbian feminist community. Uh, there was a group called Salsa Soul Sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody read Toni Morrison, uh, but there were also plays and small um, poetry readings, um, salons, things of that nature where black women would get together and express ourselves, you know, like just, and just be uh, in a group with each other where we saw other people who look like us 
Mm -hmm. Audrey was part of that scene. And, but she was an, uh, well, highly regarded intellectual uh, because of her stance on uh, racism in the women's movement and how she, you know, was very clear about her position regarding race mm -hmm. and the women's movement. So, uh, for example, she wrote, um, there was a book called Gynecology that was written by a white feminist uh, from the perspective of uh, sort of psychotherapy, but also spirituality. And um, in one part of the book, the author, Mary Daly, was talking about um, the goddesses. And another part of the book, she was talking about genital, genital cutting. Um, and the way that she talked about it was offensive. I mean, it really was. It was, um, and she used uh, quotes from people like Audrey to sort of support her argument that, you know, uh, African Americans, you know, had a judgment about that practice. Um, and so Audrey had to write an open letter to her and explain, <laughs> you, you, you know, you can't use me, um, in that way, it's offensive, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a big deal. Uh, some of her writing and her prose was a big deal. And of course she toured um, a lot of the canvases in the country, um, giving po you know, poetry readings. Her mm -hmm. poetry readings were fierce, mm -hmm. you know, very moving. So, um, Anyway, I met her through the insurgent sister class. She came to the class and she talked to us about our identity and, and, and what was our, you know, having a favorite black woman author, which none of us had. I mean, we couldn't think of anybody in it. And it came to us that we hadn't even looked at ourselves yet. Um, and here we were 18, 19 years old and we didn't even have a favorite. I mean, we had a favorite musician or favorite vocalist maybe. We didn't have a favorite black woman writer or um, we couldn't tell you uh, very much about the history of black women in leadership roles in this country. So I met Audre Lorde in that context and became a big fan. Um, in, in, 18, um, in 1986, or eight, 85 actually, I went to Africa as part of an international women's uh, conference in Nairobi. And there were a lot of black feminists there because it, you know, it's Africa. So everybody had to go. But Audrey wasn't there. And I thought, no way, she should be here. Why is it? She, why, why isn't she here? And so when I got back, um, I mentioned that to several people and one of them was my former professor. And she said, well, Audrey's sick. Mm -hmm. Her breast cancer has metastasized um, mm -hmm. and um, she now, you know, is in critical um, condition. I mean, not in hospitalized, but all the time, but very seriously. Um, so I was in such um, sorrow about that, I, that I constantly spoke about it. And some of my friends at Third World Newsreel, where I worked, um, suggested that um, I make a film about it. Mm -hmm. And I happened to work at this awesome, uh, radical mm -hmm. filmmaking, film teaching, um, and film exhibiting organization, also distributing to the educational market and art houses and, you know, the sort of art scene, mm -hmm. independent art scene. So um, I... I said, I thought, oh, okay, they, all these guys think that I can do this. 
then I probably can. And I and actually, I don't really have a choice. Audrey Lord is too important. Mm -hmm. And I know her. Mm -hmm. And I can do it. I have to. I mean, so, but I hadn't made a feature length documentary, which everybody knew that, that it would have to be. Um, and we're talking about a 60 to 90 minute film and about Audrey Lord, who is, you know, a, uh, I, I can't explain what she was. She was one of the most important black women on the planet in terms of self-determination for, for women uh, on the outlines. On the, not the ones at the Vanguard necessarily, the ones who should be at the, in the Vanguard of the liberation of our, our, our various countries, our various communities and our planet in general. If, the, if you look around a room and there is no black woman there, something's wrong. And that's what she taught, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're the only black woman there, then you it's imperative for you to speak up and um or you know act you know in a way that uh makes it evident that you have that your si your sisters are behind you i mean i think that black women in the most part walk through this world knowing that pretty much they have black women at least Mm -hmm. understand them and 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 would support their decision would understand them mm -hmm. um and i mean that's sort of what beloved was about too you know i don't that's tony morrison's novel mm -hmm. and i read a lot and i read a lot of black women women's writing and that's what made me fall in love with audrey's writing mm -hmm. it also made me fall in love with film. And in my pursuit of filmmaking, independent filmmaking, I came across Michelle Parkinson's work mm -hmm. as a documentary filmmaker. And I thought, given my inexperience and the technological side of filmmaking, I needed a strong black woman to help, you know, as well as, you know, dozens of other um, experienced uh, filmmakers, uh, mm -hmm. cinematographers, sound recorders, editors, and that, um, thing, people of that nature. So I asked Michelle, would she join the project? And she said, yes. And that, and, and it just, we just took off. There were problems. It took us six years to film the film. Mm -hmm. make the film until Audrey passed away. Mm -hmm. um, all together, it took us almost 10 years to mm -hmm. finish that film. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it was make a money and part of it was Audrey's pace mm -hmm. because she was gravely ill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michelle, can you, can you add more context? Uh, that some things that also came to mind was the end of apartheid. It's four um, o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the Mandela being free, but also, Sister Ada, as you were talking, um, I think a lot of young people take for granted the, six, the beginning of success, the, the beginning of momentum um, around social acceptance or social celebration. Uh, of our work in the 70s. So in the 70s, you have a number of black women who are publishing, um, Toni Morrison, Giovanni, Sonny Sanchez, Maya Angelou, so on and so forth. But that really, is, that really is the first time that we see this amount of work, uh, like being publicly celebrated, um, created by black women and, and being created in an authentic voice. Um, there are a lot of things that were first during the 70s and 80s that we've now come to take for granted. Um, and I name your generation as, as the one that created that momentum for us, um, that you struck out and you did the best 
at whatever it was you, you felt you could be good at? Well, I think, I think the 80s were uh, a very interesting time. Uh, you mentioned Odunde, Katina, in your introduction. And I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, where I got a great backgrounding and an expansion culturally, and in terms of my identity as well. It was, it was when I came out as a lesbian, the first time I realized I was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. um, and Odunde was one of those celebrations back in Philly that was a big deal. You were mentioning it was in Wilmington as well. So I, I'm, I'm giving bounce back on your, your reminiscence there, Katina. Can we, let's just say, let, because people don't know, Odunde is the beginning of the Yoruba New Year. It's the second Sunday. Right. We celebrated up in Philly on South Street. Literally hundreds of thousands of people come out. It is, to me, it's the, the precursor to Afropunk. And after yes. right? Yes, I, I agree with that. Black yeah. folks show up in every shade, every style, every, every expression, and it is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And still going on, you still know, still on going 40, on. If I'm 46, then I think the Dunde is 45. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Philly was the launch. That's where I went to the department of film and uh, t radio and TV back in the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, subsequently, I started doing short films on my own while I was working a, you know, uh, required job uh, at, when I got back to DC after college, I uh, started working for NBC and for what is now Fox News, it was Metro Media back then, it's a totally different world than Fox News that people know today. Mm -hmm. So in my off hours, I would, you know, put my money together and connections with other videographers, particularly black folks who were out in the field, uh, working in broadcast television then. So I began to do short films on my own. Uh, at the time I met Ada, and you're talking about the 80s. The early 80s were a time of a confluence of lots of liberation movements in mm -hmm. South Africa for feminist women. Uh, it, it, the environmental uh, movement was at one of its peaks invisibility, mm -hmm. certainly the LGBTQ movement was cresting and people were having a fit about it, mm -hmm. thank God. Mm -hmm. And I was at the time that I met Ada, before I go there, just as you mentioned, Katina, the, the wave of black women writers, mm -hmm. in, for instance, in Philly, Tony K. Bambara, Sanchez, Sonia Sanchez, mm -hmm. were all the supportive and feeding material that hit me mm -hmm. uh, in my mm -hmm. college years at Temple, but also, you know, mm -hmm. seeing each other's progress moving with a generational cohort that included Alexis DeVoe, mm -hmm. uh, Jewel Gomez, mm -hmm. uh, Hattie Gossett, Ju Hattie Gossett, mm -hmm. June Jordan was also a great voice among us. And certainly there was Art Barbara Smith, and certainly there was Audre Lorde. Audre was in a sense, the first black lesbian spark for me in my life that said, this is valid, this is true, this is important. Mm -hmm. This is power, this is beauty, this is love. And she was being published by a major uh, publishing uh, company. And many of these writers were, that's why we were aware of them in the 70s. They were getting major publication platforms to reach larger and larger audiences. Mm -hmm. So in around 86, when I met Ada, I was just finishing up production on a short film that is called Stormy, the Lady of the Jewel Box, which is about Storm de la Vie, who was a premier, premier male impersonator in the world famous Jewel Box Review mm -hmm. uh, that toured the Black Theater Circuit from the 50s to the uh, late 60s, which was an interracial uh, drag performance and female impersonation performance troupe. Well known, and again, well known because they did this tour every year through the Black theater circuit. So Black folks were well aware of, you know, the sexuality turns, the non-binary edge to what they were doing, and the skill as performers. They weren't lip syncers, they were singing, they were dancing, it was, it was art. And Stormy was the only woman in the troupe. So the, every black folks used to go just to find out which one was the woman. They used to study the show that way to figure out which one of them 
the guys that was women was a woman who was a man. Mm -hmm. In any event, I was doing a documentary on her in New York. And also being in Philly, graduating from Temple, I had access to New York. And I began to, to you know, connect with a lot of the great Black feminist and Black lesbian feminist, particularly, energy that was there, as, as Ada was pointing out, in Brooklyn at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt support for the work that I was doing. I was a writer as well. And in DC, it was a big burgeoning and connection and pride in what was happening largely visibly in New York, mm -hmm. especially in terms of Black women writers. Many of the Black gay writers who we come to know now, Essex, Craig Harris, mm -hmm. Asano Saint, were inspired by the Black lesbian writers of that time in their salons and their activism and using their art to make political activism and bring us all visibility, which was the, one, one of the big issues of the 80s, was just our visibility to say that I'm here, I'm right next to you, I'm your daughter, I'm in your church, I'm creating this thing, I feel beautiful, check, you know, I'm part of the black community as well. In any event, I was doing it in 88, finishing a production on Storming, and the sound person on that crew was JT Tagagi. It's a premier and now executive director. Is that true, Ada? Yes. She's Third still. World Newsreel. Mm -hmm. So after we were wrapping for, after a day of shooting, T, uh, JT said to me, a friend of mine is doing a film on Audrey Lloyd. And I was like, oh, oh, man. I always wanted to do a documentary on Audrey Lloyd. And it was like, yes, yes, thank God somebody's doing it. And she said, and she said Ada Gay Griffin wants you to join in the collaboration. Hmm. Check her out. And so that's how I met Ada was through JT passing on that information from Ada to me on the shoot on it entirely different, but again, in the same artistic and political circus, circuit that we were on in terms of documenting black, gay and lesbian life, history, current, et cetera, current voices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was down from the beginning and we, the first thing we shot was in 1987 uh, at Hunter College. It was one of Audrey's classes, mm -hmm. which appears in the film, as a matter of fact. The, the class was given the critique. That was the first thing we shot. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a time of Reaganomics. It was a time of many, many clashes mm -hmm. of when, you know, whose struggle is going to win over two struggle. But above all, it was like, you cannot live without struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's how you do it with the gifts you're given that are going to determine your place and your presence in life, your voice, bringing folks along and thing as, as Ada did with me. Say, come on, let's, you know, this is film or orgy that must be done. Come on, help me out, do this. Mm -hmm. So we were getting many examples like that. Mm -hmm. And again, the burgeoning energy that was percolating under many, many activist movements and strands and political strands at the time that above all told us that the personal was in fact your business, was in fact the political was personal. What you did, how you spoke, what you said, who you spoke to, who you didn't, where you put your money, who you slept with, all these things, that's political too. Mm -hmm. And there's political action in everything you do. Mm -hmm. Audrey, that was one of her tenants that struck me from the beginning, and I was so honored to be called into process with Ada to do a litany for survival. I remember it being a gritty time, and a lot of time, I, I don't think people think of the 80s as a time of militancy, but it felt very tooth and nail. It felt, it felt very much like we were all in competition for the same resources. Um, we weren't using words like scarcity and abundance, you know, at, at that time. Um, and there were a lot of mixed signals within Black communities about the acceptance of gayness. Um, a lot of us didn't even use the word gay or lesbian. We used other terms in the life, um, SGL, seeing gender loving, um, you know, many, many other terms. Um, there were a lot of black folks who um, were offended by the term queer and still are uh, offended even by the term gay or lesbian associated that with more of a, um, a white sexual identity. 
Um, and what stands out to me about Audrey Lord is um, her conviction. It's not even courage, but her conviction. You know, when I'm when I'm watching, um, when I'm watching a litany for survival, she's so grounded in who she is um, that, uh, like, it's just, it's just it's like her clarity um, and and her ability to to articulate, you know, the nuance of her reality. Um, which is one of the things that comes uh, when you're when you're navigating chronic illness. Um, you know, if you do if you do your work, you tend to get clear. But she was clear even before that. And I often wonder what it took for her, um, what it took for her to stand up and to stand out in that way at a time when most of us were closeted. Um, many of us were closeted. There were significant um, repercussions for coming out. You know, loss of family, isolation. Um, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, if we're talking about the 80s, we have to talk about the, the overwhelming impact of AIDS um, on black gay life, that, that this, is, this was something that was um, one still referred to as a gay cancer, you know, even at the time when Audrey Lord is navigating cancer, cancer, um, and that people are literally disappearing you know, one day, one day they're here, and then you know, four weeks later, um, they're gone. Um, and to be filmed was actually a rarity. You know, in the in the era when I came up, my great grandmother being filmed and photographed. You know, you got dressed up for it, and so and and um, and elder black folks being filmed, you know, felt like they needed to present a certain way in order for the camera to even come on. And so the the intimacy with which you all film her um, is impressive. You know, knowing all of the, having some understanding of all the pieces, the technological aspects of actually shooting 16 millimeter film, um, but also all of the cultural um, nuances that go into to filming um, someone who is black, someone who is navigating, navigating a chronic illness. Um, when you all approach, Ms. Lord, when you approach Audrey Lord to make the film, how did she respond? She said yes. She said well, yeah, yes. Was yeah. It, it was an immediate yes. Yes. And she, and she saw it. She saw it the way you all saw it. Well, okay. Let's put it this way. I asked her partner first, and I was a student of her partner at, okay. at the time in eighty in the mid eighties that I I found out that Audrey was sick again she had begun a relationship with my professor, my, you know, my former professor, and so who I was still in touch with. So I said, you know, Audrey, what do you think she would say about making a film? Uh, you know, us having a documentary made about her. I'll ask her, you know, it was like that. I mean, it's amazing to me that we don't, it's not even courage, it's audacity. You have the, you know, you have to have the audacity to do what you really want, to make the world that you wanna see be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm pretty good at that, you know? I, I mean, I'll just ask you, I'll just, or I will tell you, and, you know, and, you can't wait, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, no, uh, it, it was important to, to proceed immediately. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, because Ada, Ada, can you say, tell, tell us who Audrey's partner was at the time, who your professor oh, okay. was? Um, Dr. Gloria I. Joseph mm -hmm. was my professor at Hampshire College. And she's the one that taught the insurgent sister course with one of my co-students who was Carol Oliver. Got and it. Carol Oliver was very hooked into the community, the life, the, um, you know, and, and on an intellectual level and a personal level mm -hmm. and, a, and even an activist uh, sense of the word. Um, 
because as you know, I mean, New York is a very interesting place. Part of the diversity has to do uh, results in people's crossing boundaries to give support. I mean, it's not unusual for the Haitian community to be in a jam, you know, either because of police brutality or, um, you know, blatant racism or in, in, um, immigrant immigration issues. Well, when, they're, when they are ready to go, so is the rest of the Caribbean community in New York for the most part, because there's a connection for them. Um, and I felt that that connection was also with Audrey. And I don't know, I just felt like Michelle said, honored to be able to be in a position to ask her that question. Now, I don't, if, if somebody came up to you and asked, we and said we want to make a film about your life. You would have res reservations. So would I, probably, um, because that's very invasive in a sense. I'm not writing the story. It's my life, I, you know. Uh, and so, as terrifying as it was for me to ask her, I'm sure she was you know, at least ambivalent about working with us. Mm -hmm. um, and she did mention that. She did say, you know what? People have said that they were going to do this before. You're not the first one to tell me that. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, Gloria trusts me, right? Gloria, you know, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. um, she said, yes. And we had an uh, agreement. We wrote it down. Hmm. what, what the, the terms of, of her participation would be. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that I, unlike journalism, you know, so-called journalism, mm -hmm. um, and even in the context of journalism, the subject or the person that you're interviewing or that you're uh, working uh, with is the boss. I mean, you're asking questions there, they can say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but, but giving them the time to say, I'm ready for that question now, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. months and months later, or why didn't you ask me this? <laughs> you know what I mean? What, you know, you're the filmmaker, but why, uh, you know, I'm just gonna say this, or I'm just gonna read this poem. And mm -hmm. so there was a spontaneity about uh, working with Audrey uh, to that, that happened. She's smart. She's a smart, she was a smart black woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. She survived, like you said, the West Indian household, mm -hmm. you know, in Harlem in the forties, thirties, forties, fifties. She left home, ran away. Mm -hmm. And where did she go? Where else? Greenwich Village. You know what I mean? That's, you know, she found some roommates, you know, she, she, uh, you know, from the scene, from the, um, from New York City, she found some friends and, and lived with, with a variety of women mm -hmm. for years. And um, she met a man that she, you know, like you said, she, during that time in the 60s and 70s, you know, people got married and, and we address that in the film. A lot mm -hmm. of people have children um, mm -hmm. who are gay. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that, that blows some people's mind, but no one, you know, it doesn't, that's because people don't think broadly enough to, um, to realize that it is about love and it is about self-respect and respecting for others. So, uh, you know, I'm going off in a little bit of a tangent here, but uh, for me, it's all connected. And what I was really struck by what Michelle was saying, because that is so true about Audrey. She lived, you have to think about it. She, from the 1930s, when she was born, mm -hmm. there was a confluence of so many 
struggles for liberation, dignity, and there was so much pushback against anything outside um, the black and white sitcom, you know, the Cleavers and the Donna Reeds and the, you know, the very American view of life. You know, you have to have car, home, all that stuff, dress a certain way, you know, Barbie dolls came out. Um, but behind that was the, you know, the Vietnam uh, situation where black uh, brothers were, were getting killed and slaughtered when Cassius, you know, Muhammad Ali was uh, uh, stripped of all his uh, titles. I mean, we got all got Jet Magazine pretty much. And we were kept abreast from the time that Emmett Till lost his life um, and uh, Medgar Evers then later was shot in his uh, driveway of his own home and assassination after assassination um, mm -hmm. of leaders in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and the conflict between the Martin Luther King's message and Malcolm, X, Malcolm X's message and uh, like an Adam Clayton Powell's message, um, mm -hmm. Shirley Chisholm, mm -hmm. everybody was moving mm -hmm. and in the seventies and eighties. And I don't know, through it all, I think there was a sense of unity about it, but there was also a lot of criticism and and sort of reaching back in. Mm -hmm. So Audrey, you know, became like sort of torn in that way too. But um, I think she was very strong and wrote poetry that clearly reflects who she is as a person. But the most important book that she wrote, I think, is the one that is referenced in the name of this film festival. And that's Zami, a new spelling of my name. And that's what we used in the film. Uh, quite a bit of it, actually. Um, so the film's narrative comes from her reading from her own biomythography, which is what she calls her autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, from, and that, that autobiography is from her childhood until the 60s or 70s, maybe, yeah, 60s, I would say. And it, it, it'll it blow, I mean, it's wonderful. It, it'll blow your mind. I think that that's the most important thing I ever read that, that Audrey wrote was her story, her own story. And um, it was very powerful. What were some of the terms that were important to her in order in order to feel comfortable filming? Oh. No one could read her her poems. Mm -hmm. Well that, you know, except her. Mm -hmm. She backed off of that on on one occasion slightly. Mm -hmm. But technically, I violated that trust by letting um another poet read part of her poem. Um, anyway, um, that was one. Mm -hmm. uh, we agreed that she would see all the footage that pertained to her. Mm -hmm. So anytime somebody talks about her or she appears in footage, mm -hmm. she, she saw that footage mm -hmm. until she, you know, until uh, she passed away in 1992. Mm -hmm. And she was affirmed. She was stuck. Well, not stuck. Uh, how can you how can you be stuck in the Caribbean? Um, she was living in the Caribbean with her partner Gloria Joseph, mm -hmm. and um, we were sending her tapes of the footage that we shot, mm -hmm. and in a way, in a way, so that she could connect with the people that were talking about her, and are talking about the lives that they lived and the times that they lived with her. 
Mm -hmm. um, the, some of the poets that Michelle mentioned, um, Essex, Jules mm -hmm. Gomez, mm -hmm. Sonia Sanchez, um, we interviewed them. Mm -hmm. And also a couple of intellectual, more intellectual people like Barbara Smith, who's mm -hmm. a very important uh, leader mm -hmm. in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was it, can you talk about the experience of the filmmaking? I heard you say that it took upwards of 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, your, first, your first shoot is to me in many ways, the most important shoot as, as a writer um, because you, you see her process and that experience of receiving feedback from any other writer, but, but this writer is, um, it's so intimate um, and, and, and so life-changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed the way she, re she rewrote that person's poem and had already decided, yeah, this, it's done. <laughs> this, this, these are the line edits, this is what sounds right. And the other person was still you know, catching up um, and her edits were actually better. And the note that she offered, you know, that, you know, once you start writing like this, it's because you're unsure. It's like, let me, let me file that away. Um, that, that was amazing and rare. You know, it's, it's rare that we get to see inside someone's process in that way. And it's, it's naked um, and isn't some sort of put on like, oh, look, here's my studio. And this is where we push the buttons. And this is where I sit at the table. Uh, I was very rare and, and very raw. But what was, what was the filmmaking process like? I heard you say there were ups, there were downs. You're shooting 16 millimeter film and then there's the archival and these other formats. Can you talk, first of all, can you describe what it's like to shoot on a 16 millimeter film camera? And is it 16 sound or is it? Michelle. <laughs> well, well we, we shot video as well as film. And, okay. and one of the most important bits of video was shot by Ada herself, which is the last image of Audrey in the film. And she's reading a poem called Today is Not the Day. Mm -hmm. The documentary films, it's a whole different medium than narrative in that you get in people's lives and are making a movie about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a script you're following, even though you know that there are in, in the research that you have to do to, to plot the movie along, mm -hmm. it's very personal. It's a very personal way of making a film. Mm -hmm. So that Ada would go down to St. Croix, particularly toward the end of Audrey's life when energy did not permit her or weather or whatever would not permit her to be in New York. And she would just help Audrey out around the house. This was a process that I learned early in my career working with um, Betty Carter, the jazz vocalist, oh, yeah. also Sweet Honey in the Rock. I spent I spent time with them just just to be to see how their day went. Mm -hmm. I didn't just come in with a camera and shoot and say I got it and put it together. You yeah. have to see how people live without a camera. Just mm -hmm. see how they are. And so Ada was helping out, uh, Audrey out in Saint Croix. Mm -hmm. And if Audrey felt like you know she could be up for being on camera, she would mention that. If she were not, didn't have the energy, she would tell you that. Mm -hmm. But she happened to tell Ada that particular day, I think it was after laundry or something like that, if our memory serves correctly, Ada, that she said, I, I feel like, you know, I have a, a new piece here and I wanna. And so Ada just picked up the camera that she had and mm -hmm. shot it. It was really the most important piece because it's the last image of Audrey before, mm -hmm. I guess in 10 days later, she's gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it and it, it's important because it is video as well. It put it uh, foregrounds what's or or harkens to what's coming. The medium that was coming, sixteen was moving out at the time we completed this thing. Video and digital image making was what the current wave was that was coming on strong, mm -hmm. and that it ends on video. That it ends on a digital image to me is this is internal story for Michelle. But in terms of the medium, it also it 
it's also an important point, not only when the last image we have of Audrey still present, mm -hmm. but also a medium that's coming in, that's getting ready to move out this mm -hmm. tried yeah. and true 16 millimeter analog film in your hand, put it on a table, cut it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the process was very interesting along the way. Uh, we also had images that we, you know, uh, got footage from other people, that beautiful track of Audrey's readings, uh, sometimes came from Jim, Jennifer Abbott, whose film I think you're also showing in mm -hmm. this festival, mm -hmm. the edge of our, uh, the edge of each other's dreams, her documentary on the uh, Audrey Lord conference that they had in Boston, which we have segments of in the film as well. Mm -hmm. But the point being is that the medium and the media, in this case, that we used in the documentary was one that would adhere to immediacy, particularly in the latter years of Audrey's life. Because as I say, there were times she was not up to being shot. She'd come for radiation treatment, so her energy was low, or what have you. And there were times in which, you know, she'd say, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. And the crew would have to jump to it and lights up, bump, you, you have a moment. So it was a way of working, production work, that was also quite interesting in the making of a litany for survival. We got to work with a whole, I think at least 10 or 12 different cinematographers. Some of the greats that were out here. Larry Banks, Arthur Jaffa, who's now who's known as AJ. Some of the great cinematographers, JT Tagagi, I cannot say her name enough in terms of the sound quality of what came out of this experience. So it was an incredible experience over eight years of production. It really was. Some of which, as Ada just pointed out, was Audrey, staggered by Audrey's health and availability. Sometimes was staggered by, we need more money to get to where we're going and, and hire a crew, that kind of thing. So it was a very interesting filmmaking process about a fascinating, powerful woman. It was a very unique experience. It was fun. And it was fun. I answer your question. <laughs> Whenever we were shooting, fun. when we were actually had the money to shoot the film and do the work, we had so much fun usually. Mm -hmm. um, especially when we got out of New York City or we got to go to Berlin where Audrey was and experience Germany um, mm -hmm. where she had taught at, a, at the university there. And so she was well known among the Afro-German community uh, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And that was that again, I mean, what? <laughs> the afro you know. And so we filmed that and that was, and it was fun. Uh, the, the people that, that uh, Michelle mentioned, um, there were, you know, the Larry Banks, the Arthur Jaffas, but also Al Santana. Uh, yes, Al Santana. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, Ronald Crystal Gray. Griffith, Crystal Griffith. Crystal Griffith, yes. Mm -hmm. I know I'm leaving out somebody. But anyway, uh, we got to work with some of the network of people who work in independent filmmaking. Um, and Some of the best. We, it, you know, we sort of activated that squad or, you know, that community too. And once they got a whiff of who Audrey was, many of them already knew, they were very generous with their time, with their talent. Uh, and again, you have to ask them. I mean, if you don't ask, <laughs> you know what I mean? Can you come with us to St. Croix next week? <laughs> we, you know, we'll have a little bungalow or something for you to stay in, but, you know, we'll feed you, we'll do this. Sometimes it was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the loyalty and the camarader camaraderie in any community of people uh, makes work fun. I mean, I sound like Karl Marx maybe, but you know, we're born to do, do something positive. We're not 
um, we're human beings. We want to do, we want to move forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, we lost Michelle for a moment. Michelle, come back. I'll be right back. Be right back. Just need to address this. Okay. Um, <coughs> for context, 35 millimeter, very expensive format, feature films, uh, were shot on 35 millimeter and docs were typically shot on 16 millimeter. So it was news footage. Does that sound about right? And 16 millimeter had been a long standing and stable format at the point where, meaning many decades. Yeah, like World War II, all that footage right. you, you got from, from that period. I can't tell you when it started in popular. Uh, Super 8 millimeter was popular for a time. Right. We didn't use any Super 8. We used all 16 millimeter because that was the equipment that Third World Newsreel, where I worked, um, had access to. So you all had the equipment in house and you could yeah, just. Third World Newsreel is a production, it's a media arts organization, mm -hmm. but it has a production unit, it has a, a, a media distribution unit. So mm -hmm. that serves colleges and universities and organizations like uh, Zami Nabla. And um, you know, gets gets films out there to the art houses and whatnot. Um, and we also train filmmakers. So a lot of our filmmakers are are um, helped us. A lot of our students. And when I say our, they're not necessarily mine. But they, uh, there was another brother who ran that unit, and his name was um, Herman Liu. He ran it for. Oh, at least 15 years and he was a good teacher mm -hmm. and so is JT Tagagi who is now the executive director and at the time was my partner in crime at Third World Newsreel you know getting it done keep it you know holding it down um, and so we were doing that too while we were making the film we were struggling to keep a nonprofit media arts organization serving people of color from around the world um and you know inviting uh, emerging artists to join our catalog mm -hmm. and um that was incredible work but the the uh, nuts and bolts day-to-day -day issues of running a nonprofit organization were also things that were on my shoulders and JT Takagi's shoulders, but she's mm -hmm. a brilliant uh, location sound mixer. Okay. And, um, sound is great. The yeah. sound, the sound and, for this film is, is impeccable. And one of the things that um, the film does really well is audio fade outs while people are speaking and also, um, laying laying the sound of somebody else speaking on top of the sound of maybe even the same person speaking in a way that you can differentiate both that takes that takes a lot of talent that's the one editor the yeah one the placement but then also getting the levels right so that you can you can hear both things at the same time and move in the direction that the that the editor is taking the sound it's, well i think that's, that's yeah, well. the editor, who's Holly Fisher, who's an experimental filmmaker and a well-known experimental filmmaker in her own right, was extremely helpful in how the shape of Litany came to be. Mm -hmm. um, I've told this story many times. One of the things, first thing she said to me was like, you know, there's always that moment of reckoning when the director looks at the editor and is like, okay, we're agreeing to put this baby together. Let's, you know, and the first thing she says to me is, I don't do dissolves. Okay. I'm like, and that's exactly what I said, Katina. Okay. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. We're off. And so, you know, I she taught me many things about how a cut can look like a dissolve. I'm sure if you looked at the film, I'm sure you saw, thought you saw a dissolve. There's none there. Hmm. So it's 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 the layering of the sound so that we are able to talk about, and again, the title. Litany was the predominant thematic hook here, was that the, that some of these bed audio beds were litanies. You hear, as you say, uppers, lowers, middle conversations, streams of things that are coming down the road. And she really did a wonderful job in terms of uh, 
facilitating and teaching me a lot of the technical hooks of how to do that kind of layering. The film needed it. It needed to be, and it is in the shape that it is. That it's it's a conversation ongoing. What was the what was the budget? Did you all have to start and stop? From where did money come? It came from a lot of um, entities that are funded by the United States uh, National Endowment for the Arts, mm -hmm. uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, mm -hmm. you know, public television. Mm -hmm. That big pot of money that sort of spread out in different pockets not mm -hmm. many black pockets if mm -hmm. uh but we got funding from one of them which is called the national black programming consortium oh yes mbpc now but black public media is what they're called that's right that's right okay mm -hmm. well them <laughs> and uh, new york state of course mm -hmm. um australia did i see australia and australia was the first australia was to give us a grant mm -hmm. Estrella, which is a lesbian foundation, as you know. Uh, uh, ITVS, which is, ITVS. A, which is again in the PBS uh, CPB cohort there. Mm -hmm. We also, also had lots of personal donations from $5 to $1,000. Were you all having house parties or something? Were you, were you, how were you? We had one big party and <coughs> And we had a couple of screenings in DC of the of the work sample reel. Okay. That people attended. So you said about half a half a million was the yeah about half a million. And here's the thing that I learned from that process. Mm -hmm. You've got to you've got to have an edge. You've got to to speak to some one of the decision makers or some decision maker or some. Uh, administrator and get from them the ideas that that you need to convey to the decision making the, the real panel peer panel or whoever is judging the worth of your uh, or whether you're worthy uh, your project is worthy to receive funding mm -hmm. from that foundation or from that uh, <clears throat> uh, entity like the New York State Council on the Arts um though they use peer panels so does the national endowment for the arts use they use peer panels and so their your work is seen by your peers and they determine whether or not to give you the money so it's good to know that that process and it's good to get feedback from the person who manages that part, process mm -hmm. um and in some ways influences that process, the outcomes. Um, so we did, I did a lot of lobbying or, uh, you know, the lobbying is that what I did. Um, people who were running those pots of money that we mentioned. Um, and most of the time they were people of color or women, or, you know, they were, there was some affinity to the subject that, um, of the film, you know, that, that resonated with them. And maybe they um, took things in their own hands as it were, gave us a good recommendation. Um, and that's what, what I always hoped for, that we had to get this money. We, Audrey was not gonna be here much longer. Some people said, well, why don't you wait till she passes? That's what is done. Mm -hmm. You know, well, well, there's nobody, she's not Picasso. Nobody's running around shooting footage of her. I mean, yes, and if, and believe me, we knew because we looked and people gave us um, that footage. Like you mentioned, Amber Hollyball did a, a film about gay, the gay village. And Audrey was the gay village for the, time, for the time that she was there. She was very immersed in that community. So she was interviewed by this uh, documentary or, woman filmmaker um, and she donated her footage that she shot of Audrey to our project. And so one of the interviews that you see or footage from one of the in interviews is in our film. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we didn't shoot that. Mm -hmm. well, what, what was it like to be filming someone that you deeply admired and I imagine that you grew to love her too um, as, as she is preparing to go to the other side? When you started filming, did she understand that that she come to the end of her life, or was she still um, thinking that she might heal from cancer? Well, the the answer one of the answers you have is right in her writing that today is not the day. Mm -hmm. She knew it was present, but if she was up on her feet that day and you know she went about things, then today was not that day. Mm -hmm. She was aware of what it was. She was doing many holistic uh, treatments, mm -hmm. not just AMA, uh, American Medical Association type uh, mm -hmm. uh, treatments to, to juggle with that cancer. Mm -hmm. It supports on lots of levels. Mm -hmm. Also went to a warmer climate, as she says in the film. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, have, you can't deal with the cold when you have cancer. And as a cancer survivor myself, you know, in 2010, when I had cancer, it was just, so many things in that film just popped out to me as I was making my path and, and staying in trust that I would be on the other side of this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, again, like I say, in terms of us having a crew around her, we would just chill out until she felt like she was strong enough to do something. And if nothing happened that day, it did not happen that day. Yeah. So you couldn't be the frantic filmmaker of, oh, we got to stay on schedule. We got, you know. Did, did. No, we went and shot the bees because Gloria right. Joseph, her partner, mm -hmm. was a beekeeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there, that is not ironic. I mean, that is for reason. I mean, they, <laughs> Gloria related to the bees. Um, mm -hmm. And plus it was a great business and tax uh uh, right off, I guess, because she was a farmer. She was a, what is that beekeeping? I don't know what the term is. But bee wrangler. Yeah, bee wrangler. And so when Audrey <laughs> was like napping or not into it, uh, the crew went and shot the bees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we only had so many suits and, and fog blowers, and smoke blowers. So everybody couldn't go. So I didn't go. But the last thing I said was, do not tip over the bee boxes <laughs> in the grotto where the bees were piled, the bee hives were stacked up one on top of the other, five or six high. Mm -hmm. Next thing I know, the cameraman's running past me um, and, and then everybody's running past me <laughs> except Audrey and Gloria are just sitting in their chair and not moving. Mm -hmm. And they no bees stung them. Yeah. Not one. Yeah, because they were calm. And, and they knew them. And they knew they they knew they that knew these were their people. This this is real. This is a this is a connection. It's family. Hmm. Right. They said you, you just don't move. Don't move. Because they're they will attack you because there are certain bees that are assigned to hunt you down and sting you to death if they can. Mm -hmm. That's their job. Bees are, are very smart. You know, cult, they're like a cult. So uh, <laughs> that was one of the fun things, but also one of the, the ways that we got bees into the film, you know, that, that, that we were able to get the bees in there because they're important. The more, for the rest of my life, I learned, I'm interested in bees, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, you know, learning about what's the difference between the male bee and the female bee and the worker bee and the, you know, you all of that. On something. Mm -hmm. I said, you got turned on to something. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. And that's like life is like that, but, um, but how did it how did it feel to be getting to know someone who you admired and you recognize that they're that they're leaving? We're all leaving. And I that's my I don't know. I'm not I don't romanticize death that much. Mm -hmm. But um 
I think you have to just be in the moment. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm telling you, I've seen births and I've seen deaths. Mm -hmm. And th they're very close, similar processes when it comes right down to the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're out of, you don't control the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's going through something and you've got to help them, but you can't be them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's, you know, you do, you do what you can. Mm -hmm. And what we could do was make a movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we were architects, we'd have, we would have built a monument or something. You know, we would have built a uh, Statue of Liberty type of situation. I don't know, but I was into film. I was into progressive filmmaking. And so was Michelle. So that's what we did. That's our contribution. And I think I'm very proud of that. Um, it was so hard also, it was very difficult knowing that we didn't have money to film everything we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, what did I don't you know? I think this conversation, I, I, we don't, this, this is a unique conversation because we're not just talking about the film. Um, but I think the film, as Michelle said, is put together in a very poetic way. And there was so much we wanted to say. And there's so much that people said and Audrey said that the only way to fit it in was in a poetic way. Um, and there you have the layering. Um, and you sort of got to sit down and be, you know, and just let the movie unfold. Um, and then you'll get it. And hopefully people will read her work. People will demand that Sister Outsider, which is a collection of essays that she's wrote, brilliant essays. Um, you know, people will hunt it down and get their library to buy that book or buy it themselves on eBay or um, Amazon or, um, you know, half price books, whatever. Uh, we want to make sure, I wanted to make sure, I should speak for myself, I wanted young girls to read Zami, um, to know that there was a book about a little Grenadian, Grenadian um, a child of Grenadian immigrants who figured out how to be a goddess and, you know, in herself. And despite extreme circumstances, being basically kicked out of the house, you know, having an abortion, having her friends commit suicide all around her, mm. having relationships with men and not, and being confused about really what she wanted um, in terms of, of intimacy and, and, um, and then being a brilliant activist, intellectual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you one thing that I understood from um, being around Audrey and I, Death is hard, but one of the things that I learned about uh, about from Audrey was um, how do I say this? And this is back to the master's tools cannot be used to dis successfully dismantle the master's house. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Uh, it means for me that. you know, you can win, we can win. 
Um, and in fact, we just did win with this election in the United States. Uh, Black women had a huge uh, impact on what the outcome was of several uh, races in, in the um, last election in November. But be, be careful because our, what is what you want is to be the master or do you want to get rid of that whole thing must go? In other words, I don't want to own slaves. I want it to end. That is the idea. Um, I don't want to be a billionaire that doesn't have any connection to the experiences of my people and the um, hardship and the danger that they're in from pollution, from uh, poor education, et cetera. I just want to have, I want to be able to drive the same car as that uh, person, that white person, or that privileged person. I want to be able to live the fabulous life without having to think about who made the clothes that are on my back, what animal died for this handbrake bag and these, these shoes. Um, you know, that's what I think she's talking about. Um, it's a revolutionary idea, actually. That's, you, you don't want to be a master mm -hmm. if, if, if you're being oppressed by a master. Mm -hmm. um, and you have sense, like Audrey would expect you to have. Um, you want to change it all. You want it all to be different. And that's the challenge that I think comes from her. You know, here's a woman who talks about her body in terms of South Africa apartheid. You know, I think I'm the, the activists in South Af Africa and the cancer cells are these South African policemen. And I'm like, oh, no, you've got to go. You know, I'm fighting them off inside my body. I mean, that's, that. I thought that was cool uh, because it's creative, it's, it's a different way of looking at yourself and looking at life. Um, and it's so empowering, I think. It was for her, I think, uh, to just go through life looking at things a little different way. She had fun. We didn't capture her dancing, but that she could dance. Oh, oh. yeah. She was a great dancer. So um, she had a lot of fun in life, but you know, she also did her work and she challenged other people to do their work and keep writing those poems or keep organizing those meetings or uh, keep, you know, organizing those demonstrations or rallies, um, fundraisers, whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. um, so in many ways, she links the feminist movement with the Black liberation movement yes. and the gay movement yes. and the environment health and environmental movement you know it's wild she refused to wear a um prosthetic because um and barbara smith says this in the film audrey wouldn't wear a prosthetic because after she got breast cancer and lost one of her breasts she mourned her breast that she lost and she refused to get a prosthetic because she didn't believe in hiding the truth about what women go through. Hmm. And among black women, it's one out of it's eight now. One out of eight black women get breast cancer hmm. at some point in their life, our lives. Sister think, Ada, uh, Ms., um, M Michelle, do you mind yeah. sharing some parting words? This is, we're gonna wrap this up. Do you mind sharing some parting words, Sister Ada? That was, that was beautiful. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna bounce back and move, move forward and open up the space here so Ada can, can conclude us with great energy and love. Um, the point being that you asked, what was it like working with somebody that you knew was dying and they knew that they were dying? What it, what, what it was was that Audrey had already done a burst of light she had done the cancer journals. Mm -hmm. She was about facing it, be brave, and, the, and your bravery will carry you through where you're supposed to go. 
And that kind of vibe was translated to us as a crew who were around her. Mm -hmm. Be brave. Don't come up in here crying. Don't, uh-uh, 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 none of that, none of that. We got work to do. I'll be available when I'm available. Please feel the hospitality and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that bravery is, again, and something I also got from my good friend Essex Hemphill, the writer, is that these folks made me, made me brave. Mm -hmm. They upped that quotient for me and up what bravery looked like. It's not that usual thing where you're armed to the teeth and, you know, charging for. It's how you make that step, every, how you make the next step when you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. you know, how you face down AIDS, how you bring in community mm -hmm. that makes us whole. So these are the points that were raised by, by the film for me and, and some of the life lessons I walked away with. Uh, just being around Ada and, and seeing her tenacity and audacity, Ada, in pressing this baby forward. Mm -hmm. And we were with the mother of tenacity and audacity, which was who was Audrey Lord. Mm -hmm. How could we how could we do less? Mm -hmm. How could we do less in the time and with the materials we had? Well, um, when I when I watch a litany for survival, it is clear to me that Audrey Lord and everyone that you interviewed in support of her story felt safe and felt loved. And um, it's important to, to say that because so often black folks, especially from that era, our stories um, were either autobiographical, which is great because then it's in our own voice, but by and large, our stories were given or taken, given to or taken by uh, white people. And, and then you can see that too in how, in how the person being interviewed, whether they feel safe whether they feel comfortable, whether they feel, whether they feel validated by the person on the other side of the camera. But in, a, in Litany, it is, it's very clear that, um, that these are people who are in love. The people in front of the camera are in love with the people behind the camera and, and, uh, and that it's circular. Um, so that, that really stands out to me. Um, thank you. How do people access a Litany for Survival? How, how can people see it beyond uh, the, the festival? How can they share it with their classrooms? They need contact, to. Yeah, contact the Newsreel. Right. Uh, right. TWN at TWN.org. That's right. Is their uh, email or okay. www.twn.org. Okay. And then we have some resources that we're going to make available through Zami Nobla social media. And Zami Nobla is looking for a social media intern, uh, someone to help boost presence on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. This is gonna be an exchange for college credit with the possibility of pay down the line. So just, this is a shout out to our audience on, on Thursday. If you know someone who's looking for an opportunity to be mentored uh, and loved on by, by elder black lesbians, then, then this is the hit right here. This is what you wanna do. May I also say, Katrina, that we believe that on Audrey's birthday this year, on Google, they will have a doodle devoted to Audrey Lord. In other words, when you, you know, don't go to Yahoo, or don't go to, um, I don't know where other uh, search engines you got going. Uh, for Firefox. <laughs> Firefox. Well, yeah, Google. If you're on Firefox, go to Google for your searching and um, you'll probably see a doodle about Audrey on her birthday, the 18th of February. An Aquarius. Oh, an Aquarius. Everlasting. Yes, got to be an Aquarius. All right, do you remember the cue? One, two, three, cut. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say cut.